Since we uh, began reopening of Ohio after the initial state home order, we've listened to experts uh, who've told us that being outside is better when you can be outside. Um, that combined with mask wearing, social distancing, proper hygiene, certainly helps us uh, slow down COVID-19. Um, we've seen Ohioans following uh, the expert advice, but we also know that colder months are, are coming. And uh, so we thought we'd bring an expert in. Uh, joining us today is Ohio State University environmental engineer, Dr. Mark Weir. Uh, he is the co-director of the Ecology, Epidemiology, and Population Health Program at OSU Infectious Disease Institute. Doctor, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We, we, we appreciate it very much. You know, we've heard a lot over the last few days um, about uh, aerosolized particles and droplets um, and how COVID-19 spreads uh, on the news this morning about that. And I wonder if you could maybe just give us a, a, a 101 class that uh, about how that works. Of course. Um, so <clears throat> aerosols in general at first sound kind of scary, um, especially when somebody's talking about airborne. If somebody says the word airborne, people start to react to that. So. Um, one thing I did, I put together a couple slides that might be able to help. Okay, we'll look at those, sure. Yeah, so if you go to the first one after the title, um, every time that you cough, um, if you're <clears throat> coughing or if you're sneezing, you're obviously expiring out or expelling out uh, droplets and other particles, and those finer, smaller particles that don't drop out within the, the three to six feet range that we've heard about so much are the aerosols. And so the top image of those three bars is the very small particles and they're going farther afield. And it all depends on the shape of your mouth when you're talking, how forcefully you're talking, how quietly you're talking, how much you're coughing, type of coughing that you're doing, things like that. There's a lot that goes into it, but this happens all the time. And so it's something that we deal with on a consistent basis. So if you look at the next slide, we have models that we've been putting together that have been trying to look at, well, what are the overall building and room risks associated with people speaking, singing, talking, coughing, sneezing, when they have SARS-CoV-2 or uh, COVID-19 or something else. So we've built these kind of models for influenza, uh, MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1, so the first SARS that came around, um, to be able to try and understand these. Every virus is a little different in how it forms itself as a or how many viruses are in those aerosols because just because it's an aerosol doesn't mean it's a virus and just because it has aerosolized a particle that came out from your mouth doesn't mean that there's viruses in those aerosols and so what you're looking at is a simulation that we put together with a, a great colleague down in um, South Carolina um, and Dr. Hoke put these together as a way of being able to say well as we are increasing our controls such as air exchange rates filtration of the room um, mixture of air from the outside, so make up air is what we call that. What is it actually going to be doing by way of removing the particles? And it depends on what you can run and how you can operate it, but you can have a fairly good margin of safety being able to control for the aerosol. So you go to the last slide. This is really similar to what we've been talking about this entire time with regards to the different barriers and the different levels of control. And so it's basically between the virus and you are a series of walls that you can put in place or a series of barriers that you can put in place. We already know about face masks, hand washing and social distancing. Now we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about aerosols, there's engineering options for us at this point to be able to, to work through. So while aerosols are a new thing for, for, uh, for us to be talking about with regards to SARS-CoV-2, it is a known quantity from, with regards to ideas of how to control it, knowledge and technology that we have to be able to try and control it. Now it's at this stage here of optimizing or, or finessing those controls so that they can be as effective as possible for this particular pathogen. And, and Dr. So, I, so we can understand, uh, Eric, if you can go back to the last, actually back two slides, um, uh, you've got before cough then three minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, um, just make sure I understand this and our viewers can understand it. You've got something on here that is red. You've got some that's blue. What's the difference and how big a room is it? 
So that is an average size uh, shared office space, the way we built that one out. So um, we didn't put in the cubicle walls just yet. We were just putting in the, the air flows, the stocks and flows and everything. The red is somebody who has um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what you'll end up seeing is that how that kind of mixes in the environment, but it doesn't end up contaminating the entire room. How the air flows through the room dictates where it's going to be able to deposit on surfaces, who's going to be able to inhale it later on and where it's going to go into the, the ventilation system itself. Okay. Um, we know outside is generally better than inside. Uh, and you want to just tell us why that is. Maybe it's obvious, but uh, just tell us anyway. There's, I mean, there's a couple of pieces to it. Um, one is that you'll get much more dynamic air flows when you're outside. So um, deposition and fallout from the aerosol, so the, how the aerosols fall out of the air typically can occur qu uh, quicker. Um, it'll disperse out into a wider area. There's just more space for it to be able to go somewhere. There's a, an old wrong saying when you're talking about pollution, which is the solution to pollution is dilution. While that's not correct for how you handle environmental pollution, in this case, the solution is dilution, where Dilution means you take the same amount of something but put it into a bigger volume, and now you have less ability for you to be able to inhale it. So that is the, that is one of the solutions then? It is. It is. And, and outdoors is, is where you're going to be able to get the absolute largest volume. Plus you have all the other dynamics of things like UV exposure, um, you just being able to move around in a, in a larger, more basically more random kind of pattern as well. And what we try to do when we're talking about on the indoor side of things is we try to mimic that where we can, bringing in as much fresh air from the outdoors, removing as much air from indoors as possible, and so on. Uh, just, just so uh, I'm following here, um, you want to tell me about droplets as opposed to the aerosolized particles? What's, 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 what's the difference, if there is a difference? Yep, so uh, the difference is size. So anything that is um, within droplet size range, so about um, four microns and up, so very, very small particles. Yeah, we're still talking about very small particles, but they're heavy enough and large enough that within about three feet to six feet range is where they really start to slope down. You can actually see the trajectory going out and sloping down, and they just end up hitting people's pants or the floor or, or somewhere else. Okay, so I'm speaking right now. What would I expect to happen? So you would expect, predominantly, you would end up seeing mostly droplets coming out, and then they would fall down. So if you had a special type of camera that could actually track the particles coming out, you'd see a bulk of them being droplets, and then you would have a mist of aerosols that would be able to come out. And if you are up and projecting your voice, they'll come up at a little bit more of an angle and have a specific cone of expansion from there. Okay. Now, we've read or we've heard this kind of controversy. CDC put something up on, then they take it down. Uh, let's put that aside for a moment. But, but what is it that we actually do know? What, let's start with what we know at this point. I mean, we know we've continued to learn. Scientists have continued to learn throughout this. Let's start with what we, what we, what we do know and then what we may think, however you want to explain it. So what we do know is that the virus has to be able to get to essentially the, the back of your throat into what we call the nasal pharyngeal region. So that's where it has to start to deposit. It has to be able to deposit in the upper respiratory tract, up in that upper portion of your respiratory system. So not your mouth, but back, back where the wind is starting to go in, it goes down into your lungs. That's where it needs to deposit. So it needs to land on that surface and then it needs to be able to infect cells that, are, that make up that portion of your respiratory system. So we know that. Now, how that gets delivered is where the question ends up residing. Where, when we were talking about surfaces, so at first, surfaces were a massively dominant component of transmission. So when we say transmission, we mean that the virus has to go from somewhere in the environment to somewhere into you. And the surfaces were, you would touch the surface and then you would touch your nose or you would touch your eye and then it would be able to get into the mucous system and make its way to where it needs to be. Um, that ended up being downgraded in a level of importance the more we learned about the droplet spread. The droplet spread is where that three to six foot range comes in, 
predominantly three feet. And that's where you're more likely to be able to get those larger particles actually hit your face. You can respire those particles um, or there'll be a much more contaminated area in front of you to drive surface risks. Now aerosols are you're beyond six feet, you're beyond into about 10 feet or so out and you can still inhale those particles. Now, what we're talking about is if the majority of them that come out are droplets, that means that a smaller amount are gonna be aerosols and it still takes a fairly good amount of virus for you to be able to inhale and actually become sick. So we're, now we're in that range of how much is enough to make you sick when we're talking about aerosols. So that's where a lot of the, the back and forth and the discussion and research has been on is how important are aerosols in exposure. We, we've known for a little while that aerosols are a component, but how important those aerosols are is the question. And that's where CDC had put something up and then took it back down for, you'd have to ask CDC reasons. But, um, you know, having, having worked at, at EPA, you know, you, you want to make sure everything is right down to the, you know, exact dots on eyes and everything else. So that could be what it is as well. So as we look at this and as we head towards the winter and we look at public buildings, we look at schools, we look at businesses, we look at houses, um, you know, what should we be thinking about and what are some of the things that we can do to deal with it? I mean, if you talk about, you talked about the droplets, that would seem from what you said to be basically a function of distance. Uh, would that be right? Yes. The, the aerosolized particles, that's different. Uh, it would seem to be, would that be a matter of circulation uh, based on what would be the variables there? Exactly, circulation is one of the key ones. and. The first and foremost is to find out what kind of control you have over a ventilation system in your home, business, or elsewhere. Uh, one key very important thing is that air conditioning and heating are not the same as ventilation. Ventilation is just focused on moving the air around. What energy you put in to either heat it or remove nor to cool it is the air conditioning or the heating component. So if you may have an AC system, it doesn't mean that you have a ventilation system. So that's one key thing to think about first. Circulation is a great way to think of it. You're moving the air and it's, it's a component of, of three big pieces. There's the air exchange rates. How often can you take all the air in the room and remove it and replace it with fresh? The makeup air, or we call that makeup air in, in engineering and industrial hygiene, is how much of the outdoor air can I bring in that's absolutely fresh, doesn't have SARS-CoV-2 in it. And then the other one is filtration and they all work together. And so it is not really so much a component of getting as much air out as possible, as often as possible. That will have a beneficial effect, but you really need to look at all three of those pieces working together for you to okay. be able to find. Uh, uh, okay, okay, get, I, I wrote down two, I missed one. So you've got, you've got filtration, you've got air exchange ratio. What's the third one? Um, makeup air, so that amount of outdoor air to bring in. Okay. You want to go through those quickly for me? Sure. So the, the makeup air is where you're talking about where you don't have the virus. It's outdoor air. Um, so even if there is a, a small amount of virus that's in the outdoor air, it's much, much smaller than what would be in the indoor air. And it's typically zero, or at least lower than we can detect it. So that air being brought in is fresh, it's clean, you can filter it so, be, so it becomes cleaner, so you remove allergens and, and any other kind of chemicals that are in it before it comes into the building. And then you circulate that through the, the building. Then you have to, you typically have to recirculate some of the air for energy efficiency reasons, as well as humidity controls and things like that. And that's where air exchange rates come in, as well as filtration, they kind of work hand in hand in that you can remove a lot of the air and replace it back into the room. But if you're not filtering it, you're, you're just circulating air from, from uh, within the room to another room or within the same room. Um, and so, you know, the air exchange rates is where, think of it where you have the volume of room that you are in, so height uh, by, so height times area is your volume, take all of that volume, remove it within an hour, 
How many times can you do that is your air changes per hour or your air exchange rate. And then the filtration is just filtration. So if you've ever seen an, an HVAC filter, um, what you're basically doing is just pushing air through very, very small holes and it's gonna remove um, the bioaerosols. Some of them are small enough to be able to remove viruses, but the majority of places can remove the bioaerosols predominantly that are harboring the virus. So for our viewers out there, let's say they own a house, um, let's say it's a 20 year old house. Um, what is, from a practical point of view, let's see, let's say that, uh, you know, people are in and out, or let's even say it's a business. Let's assume it's a business and it's a retail business. So they have people coming in and out every, every single day. What should they do? How do, how do they get on top of this if they want to try to do something to in, improve the situation? So if they're a business, they have a great opportunity to be able to control the air in their building. If they have that, if they have the technology to be able to do that and can, you know, have a very impactful uh, benefit on limiting spread um, by, by improving the air inside their buildings. Um, what they want to do is they want to talk to whomever it is that they work with as their licensed HVAC technician or engineer. Um, so whoever they have that comes out that's licensed that is able to do the maintenance and operation updates and, and preventative maintenance on their system, have them come out and survey it, make sure they know what they can actually operate. Um, and then what they can do is work with them and say, well, how high of an air change rate can I have through what size filter and how much outdoor air can I bring in and still be able to operate within a profitable scheme? Because you don't want to go out of business um, operating something that's just too costly. Um, so sit down with them, make sure that you have a good plan of how you're going to be able to go forward with that. Um, the CDC has a great table for clinical settings, but it still works for other indoor spaces on a number of uh, on different air change rates to be able to use. Um, so you can always refer to that if you want. Um, and I'd have to sit down with them, make sure that they are um, appropriately licensed and able to be able to help you with that. Um, and if they recommend to talk to a ventilation engineer, see if that works within your budget and then talk with them. Doctor, we're going to, with your help, we hope, uh, put something up uh, on our webpage uh, in a uh, short while, uh, maybe to give people some better information. But until we get that up again, what's the best place for them to look? Uh, let's say they've, they've got a shop or they've got a house and they want to go look up uh, what they really need to do so that they can intelligently talk to their heating expert or their, and their air conditioning expert. So great way to start um, by taking a dive into indoor air is to look, go to the EPA's website and look for indoor air quality. Um, and that's going to give you a bit of a crash course into indoor air quality. It's going to be focused around carbon dioxide buildup for how many, you know, by respir respiring, how are you contaminating the room as well as anything that's volatilizing or, um, you know, chemicals that are coming off of the desk surfaces and things like that. That's what that page is mostly focused on. It's a great crash course into what indoor air quality is, precise definitions of air change, air exchange rates. So if, if I'm not being clear, then you can go there and, th and they have a great resource there. Um, from there, what you can do is you can refer to CDC websites. Now, um, some of those are clinically oriented and I think that's one of the things that we'll be working with you on, on making sure that we have a, a, a translate, you know, translation, make sure we understand how things are, are moving forward. But let's start with the EPA. And then from the EPA website, contact your um, HVAC licensed technician. Doctor, thank you very much. We will be, uh, we'll be back in touch with you, but we appreciate you coming on today and <clears throat> giving us a uh, introductory course. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you. <clears throat>